Essays on some unsettled questions of political economy. Essay number four, part two. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Essays on some unsettled questions of political economy by John Stuart Mill. Essay number four, on profits and interest, part one. The profits of stock are the surplus which remains to the capitalist after replacing his capital, and the ratio which that surplus bears to the capital itself is the rate of profit. This being the definition of profits, it might seem natural to adopt as a sufficient theory in regard to the rate of profit that it depends upon the productive power of capital. Some countries are favored beyond others, either by nature or art, in the means of production. If the powers of the soil, or of machinery, enable capital to produce what is necessary for replacing itself, and twenty per cent more, profits will be twenty per cent, and so on. This, accordingly, is a popular mode of speaking on the subject of profits, but it has only the semblance, not the reality, of an explanation. The productive power of capital, through a common and for some purposes a convenient expression, is a delusive one. Capital, strictly speaking, has no productive power. The only productive power is that of labor, assisted, no doubt, by tools, and acting upon materials. That portion of capital which consists of tools and materials may be said, perhaps, without any great impropriety, to have a productive power, because they contribute, along with the labor, to the accomplishment of production. But that portion of capital, which consists of wages, has no productive power of its own. Wages have no productive power. They are the price of a productive power. Wages do not contribute, along with labor, to the production of commodities, no more than the price of tools contributes along with the tools themselves. If labor could be had without purchase, wages might be dispensed with. That portion of capital which is expended in the wages of labor is only the means by which the capitalist procures to himself, in the way of purchase, the issue of that labor in which the power of production really resides. The proper view of capital is that anything whatever which a person possesses constitutes his capital, provided he is able, and intends, to employ it, not in consumption for the purpose of enjoyment, but in possessing himself of the means of production, with the intention of employing those means productively. Now the means of production are labor, implements, and materials. The only productive power which anywhere exists is the productive power of labor, implements, and materials. We need not, on this account, altogether proscribe the expression productive power of capital, but we should carefully note that it can only mean the quantity of real productive power which the capitalist, by means of his capital, can command. This may change, though the productive power of labor remains the same. Wages, for example, may rise, and then although all the circumstances of production remain exactly as they were before, the same capital will yield a less return, because it will set in motion a less quantity of productive labor. We may therefore consider the capital of a producer as measured by the means which he has of possessing himself of the different essentials of production, namely, labor, and the various articles which labor requires as materials, or of which it avails itself as aids. The ratio between price which he has to pay for these means of production, and the produce which they enable him to raise, is the rate of his profit. If he must give for labor and tools four-fifths of what they will produce, the remaining fifth will constitute his profit, and will give him a rate of one in four, or twenty-five per cent on his outlay. It is necessary here to remark what cannot indeed by any possibility be misunderstood, but might possibly be overlooked in cases where attention to it is indispensable, viz. that we are speaking now of the rate of profit, not the gross profit. If the capital of the country is very great, 
a profit of only five per cent upon it may be much more ample may support a much larger number of capitalists and their families in much greater affluence than a profit of twenty five per cent on the comparatively small capital of a poor country the gross profit of a country is the actual amount of necessities conveniences and luxuries which are divided among its capitalists but whether this be large or small the rate of profit may be just the same the rate of profit is the proportion which the profit bears to the capital which the surplus produce after replacing the outlay bears to the outlay in short if we compare the price paid for labor and tools with what labor and those tools will produce from this ratio we may calculate the rate of profit as the gross profit may be very different though the rate of labor be the same so also may the absolute price paid for labor and tools be very different and yet the proportion between the price paid and the produce obtained may be just the same for greater clearness let us omit for the present the consideration of tools materials etc and conceive production as the results solely of labor in a certain country let us suppose the wages of each laborer are one quarter of wheat per year and one hundred men can produce in one year one hundred twenty quarters here the price paid for labor is to the produce of that labor as one hundred to one hundred twenty the profits are twenty per cent suppose now that in another country wages are just double what they are in the country before supposed namely two quarters of wheat per year for each laborer but suppose likewise that the productive power of labor is double what it is in the first country that by the greater fertility of the soil one hundred men can produce two hundred forty quarters instead of one hundred twenty as before here it is obvious that the real price paid for labor is twice as great in the one country as in the other but the produce being also twice as great the ratio between the price of labor and the produce of labor is exactly the same an outlay of two hundred quarters gives a return of two hundred forty quarters and profits as before are twenty per cent profits then meaning not gross profits but the rate of profit depend not upon the price of labor tools and materials but upon the ratio between the price of labor tools and materials and the produce of them upon the proportionate share of the produce of industry which it is necessary to offer in order to purchase that industry and the means of setting it in motion we have hitherto spoken of tools buildings and materials as essentials of production coordinate with labor and equally indispensable with it this is true but it is also true that tools buildings and materials are themselves the produce of labor and that the only cause causes of monopoly excepted of their having any value is the labor which is required for their production if tools buildings and materials were the spontaneous gifts of nature requiring no labor either in order to produce or to appropriate them and if they were thus bestowed upon mankind in indefinite quantity and without the possibility of being monopolized they would still be as useful as indispensable as they are now but since they could like air and the light of the sun be obtained without cost or sacrifice they would form no part of the expenses of production and no production of the produce would be required to be set aside in order to replace the outlay made for these purposes the whole produce therefore after replacing the wages of labor would be clear profit to the capitalist labor alone is the primary means of production the original purchase money which has been paid for everything tools and materials like other things have originally cost nothing but labor and have a value in the market only because wages have been paid for them the labor employed in making the tools and materials being added to the labor afterward employed in working up the materials by aid of the tools 
the sum total gives the whole of the labor employed in the production of the completed commodity. In the ultimate analysis, therefore, labor appears to be the only essential of production. To replace capital is to replace nothing but the wages of the labor employed. Consequently, the whole of the surplus, after replacing wages, is profits. From this it seems to follow that the ratio between the wages of labor and the produce of that labor gives the rate of profit, and thus we arrive at Mr. Ricardo's principle that profits depend upon wages, rising as wages fall, and falling as wages rise. To protect this proposition, the most perfect form in which the law of profits seems to have been yet exhibited, against misapprehension, one or two explanatory remarks are required. If by wages be meant what constitutes the real affluence of the laborer, the quantity of produce which he receives in exchange for his labor, the proposition that profits vary inversely as wages will be obviously false. The rate of profit, as has been already observed and exemplified, does not depend upon the price of labor, but upon the proportion between the price of labor and the produce of it. If the produce of labor is large, the price of labor may also be large without any diminution in the rate of profit, and in fact the rate of profit is highest in those countries, as for example North America, where the laborer is most highly remunerated. For the wages of labor, though so large, bear a less proportion to the abundant produce of labor there than elsewhere. But this does not affect the truth of Mr. Ricardo's principle, as he himself understood it, because an increase in the laborer's real comforts was not considered by him as a rise of wages. In his language, wages were only said to rise when they rose not in mere quantity, but in value. To the laborer himself, he would have said, the quantity of his remuneration is the important circumstance but its value is the only thing of importance to the person who purchases his labor. The rate of profits depends not upon absolute or real wages, but upon the value of wages. If, however, by value, Mr. Ricardo had meant exchangeable value, this proposition would still have been remote from the truth. Profits depend no more upon the exchangeable value of the laborer's remuneration than upon its quantity. The truth is, that by the exchangeable value is meant the quantity of commodities which the laborer can purchase with his wages, so that when we say the exchangeable value of wages, we say their quantity under another name. Mr. Ricardo, however, did not use the word value in the sense of exchangeable value. Occasionally, in his writings, he could not avoid using the word as other people use it, to denote a value in exchange, but he more frequently employed it, in a sense peculiar to himself, to denote cost of production, in other words, the quantity of labor required to produce the article, that being his criterion of cost of production. Thus, if a hat could be made with ten days' labor in France, and with five days' labor in England, he said that the value of a hat was double in France of what it was in England. If a quarter of corn could be produced a century ago, with half as much labor as is necessary at present, Mr. Ricardo said that the value of a quarter of corn had doubled. Mr. Ricardo, therefore, would not have said that wages had risen, because a laborer could obtain two pecks of flour instead of one for a day's labor. But if last year he received for a day's labor something which required eight hours' labor to produce it, and this year something which requires nine hours, then Mr. Ricardo would say that wages had risen. A rise of wages, with Mr. Ricardo, meant an increase in the cost of production of wages, an increase in the number of hours' labor which go to produce the wages of a day's labor, an increase in the proportion of the fruits of labor which the laborer receives for his own share, an increase in the ratio between the wages of his labor, and the produce of it. This is the theory, the reasoning, of which it is the result, has 
been given in the preceding paragraphs. Some of Mr. Ricardo's followers, or more properly, of those who have adopted in most particulars the views of political economy which his genius was the first to open up, have given explanation of Mr. Ricardo's doctrine to nearly the same effect as the above, but in rather different means. They have said that profits depend not on absolute, but on proportional wages, which they expound to mean the proportion which the laborers and mass receive of the total produce of the country. It seems, however, to be rather an unusual and inconvenient use of language to speak of anything as depending upon the wages of labor, and then to explain that by wages of labor you do not mean the wages of an individual laborer, but of all the laborers in the country collectively. Mankind will never agree to call anything a rise in wages, except a rise in the wages of individual laborers, and it is therefore preferable to employ language tending to fix attention upon the wages of the individual. The wages, however, on which profits are said to depend, are undoubtedly proportional wages, namely, the proportional wages of one laborer, that is, the ratio between the wages of one laborer and, not the whole produce of the country, but, the amount of what one laborer can produce, the amount of that portion of the collective produce of the industry of the country, which may be considered as corresponding to the labor of one individual laborer. Proportional wages, thus understood, may be concisely termed the cost of production of wages, or more concisely still, the cost of wages, meaning their cost in the original purchase money labor. We have now arrived at a distinct conception of Mr. Ricardo's theory of profits in its most perfect state, and this theory we conceive to be the basis of the true theory of profits. All that means to do is to clear it from certain difficulties which still surround it, and which, though a greater degree apparent than real, are not to be put aside as wholly imaginary. Though it is true that tools, materials, and buildings, it is to be wished that there were some compact designation for all these essentials of production taken together, are themselves the produce of labor, and are only on that account to be ranked among the expenses of production. Yet the whole of their value is not resolvable into the wages of the laborers by whom they were produced. The wages of those laborers were paid by a capitalist and that capitalist must have the same profit upon his advances as any other capitalist. When, therefore, he sells the tools or materials, he must receive from the purchaser not only the reimbursement of the wages he has paid, but also as much more as will afford him the ordinary rate of profit. And when the producer, after buying the tools and employing them in his own occupation, comes to estimate his gains, he must set aside a portion of the produce to replace not only the wages paid both by himself and by the toolmaker, but also the profits of the toolmaker advanced by himself out of his own capital. It is not correct, therefore, to state that all which the capitalist retains after replacing wages forms his profit. It is true the whole return to capital is either wages or profits, but profits do not compose merely the surplus after replacing the outlay. They also enter into the outlay itself. Capital is expended partly in paying or reimbursing wages, and partly in paying the profits of other capitalists whose concurrence was necessary in order to bring together the means of production. If any contrivance, therefore, were devised by which that part of the outlay which consists of previous profits could be either wholly or partially dispensed with, it is evident that more would remain as the profit of the immediate producer, while as the quantity of labor necessary to produce a given quantity of the commodity would be unaltered, as well as the quantity of produce paid for that labor. It seems that the ratio between the price of labor and its produce would be the same as before, but the cost of production of wages would be the same, proportional wages the same, 
and yet profits, different. To illustrate this by a simple instance, let it be supposed that one-third of the produce is sufficient to replace the wages of the laborers who have been immediately instrumental in the production, that another third is necessary to replace the materials used and the fixed capital worn out in the process, while the remaining third is clear gain, being a profit of fifty per cent. Suppose, for example, that sixty agricultural laborers, receiving sixty quarters of corn for their wages, consume fixed capital and seed amounting to the value of sixty quarters more, and that the result of their operation is a produce of one hundred eighty quarters. When we analyze the price of the seed and tools into its elements, we find that they must have been the produce of the labor of forty men, for the wages of those forty, together with profit at the rate previously supposed, fifty per cent, make up sixty quarters. The produce, therefore, consisting of one hundred eighty quarters, is the result of the labor altogether of one hundred men, namely, the sixty first mentioned, and the forty by whose labor the fixed capital and the seed were produced. Let us now suppose, by way of an extreme case, that some contrivance is discovered, whereby the purposes to which the second third of the produce had been devoted may be dispensed with altogether, that some means are invented by which the same amount of produce may be procured without the assistance of any fixed capital, or the consumption of any seed or material sufficiently valuable to be worth calculating. Let us, however, suppose that this cannot be done without taking on a number of additional laborers, equal to those required for producing the seed and fixed capital, so that the saving shall be only in the profits of the previous capitalist. Let us, in conformity with this supposition, assume that in dispensing with the fixed capital and seed, value sixty quarters, it is necessary to take on forty additional laborers, receiving a quarter of corn each, as before. The rate of profit has inevitably risen. It has increased from fifty per cent to sixty per cent. A return of one hundred eighty quarters would not before be obtained but by an outlay of one hundred twenty quarters. It can now be obtained by an outlay of no more than one hundred. Here, therefore, is an undeniable rise of profits. Have wages, in the sense above attached to them, fallen or not? It would seem not. The produce, one hundred eighty quarters, is still the result of the same quantity of labor as before namely, the labor of one hundred men. A quarter of corn, therefore, is still as before the produce of ten-eighteenths of a man's labor for a year. Each laborer receives, as before, one quarter of corn. Each there receives the produce of ten-eighteenths of a year's labor of one man. That is, the same cost of production. Each receives ten-eighteenths of the produce of his own labor, that is, the same proportional wages, and the laborers collectively still receive the same proportion, namely, ten-eighteenths of the whole produce. The conclusion, then, cannot be resisted that Mr. Ricardo's theory is defective at the rate of profits does not exclusively depend upon the value of wages, in his sense, namely, the quantity of labor of which the wages of a laborer are the produce, that it does not exclusively depend upon proportional wages, that is, upon the proportion which the laborers collectively receive of the whole produce, or the ratio which the wages of an individual labor bear to the produce of his individual labor. Those political economists, therefore, who have always dissented from Mr. Ricardo's doctrine, or who, having at first admitted, ended by discarding it, were so far in the right, but they committed a serious error, in this, that, with the usual one-sidedness of disputants, they knew no medium between admitting absolutely and dismissing entirely, and saw no other course than utterly to reject what it would have been sufficient to modify. It is remarkable how very slight a modification will suffice to render Mr. Ricardo's doctrine completely true. It is even doubtful whether he himself, if called upon to adapt 
his expressions to this particular case, would not have so explained his doctrine as to render it entirely objectionable. It is perfectly true that in the example already made use of, a rise of profits takes place, while wages considered in respect to the quantity of labor of which they are the produce have not varied at all. But though wages are still the produce of the same quantity of labor as before, the cost of production of wages has nevertheless fallen, for into cost of production there enters another element besides labor. We have already remarked, and the very example out of which the difficulty arose presupposes it, that the cost of production of an article consists generally of two parts, the wages of the labor employed, and the profits of those who, in any antecedent stage of the production, have advanced any portion of those wages. An article, therefore, may be the produce of the same quantity of labor as before, and yet, if any portion of the profits which the last producer has to make good to previous producers can be economized, the cost of production of the article is diminished. Now, in our example, a diminution of this sort is supposed to have taken place in the cost of production of corn. The production of that article has become less costly in the ratio of six to five. A quantity of corn, the means of producing which could not previously have been secured, but at an expense of a hundred twenty quarters, can now be produced by means which one hundred quarters are sufficient to purchase. But the laborer is supposed to receive the same quantity of corn as before. He receives one quarter. The cost of production of wages has therefore fallen one-sixth. A quarter of corn, which is the remuneration of a single laborer, is indeed the produce of the same quantity of labor as before, but its cost of production is nevertheless diminished. It is now the produce of ten-eighteenths of a man's labor, and nothing else, whereas formerly it required for its production the conjunction of that quarter of labor with an expenditure in the form of reimbursement profit amounting to one-fifth more. If the cost of production of wages had remained the same as before, profits could not have risen. Each laborer received one quarter of corn, but one quarter of corn at that time was the result of the same cost of production as one and one-fifth quarter now. In order, therefore, that the laborer should receive the same cost of production, each must now receive one quarter of corn plus one-fifth. The labor of one hundred men could not be purchased at this price for less than one hundred twenty quarters and the produce, 180 quarters, would yield only 50 per cent, as first supposed. Begin footnote. It would be easy to go over in the same manner any other case. For instance, if we suppose that, instead of dispensing with the whole of the fixed capital, material, etc., and taking on laborers in equal number to those by whom these were produced, half only of the fixed capital and material is dispensed with, so that instead of sixty laborers at a fixed capital worth sixty quarters of corn, we have eighty laborers with a fixed capital worth thirty. The numerical statement of this case is more intricate than that in the text, but the result is not different. End footnote. It is therefore strictly true that the rate of profits varies inversely as the cost of production of wages. Profits cannot rise unless the cost of production of wages falls exactly as much, nor fall unless it rises. The proof of this proposition has been stated in figures, and in a particular case we shall now state it in general terms, for all cases. We have supposed, for simplicity, that wages are paid in the finished commodity. The agricultural laborers in our example were paid in corn, and if we had called them weavers, we should have supposed them to be paid in cloth. The supposition is allowable, for it is obviously of no consequence in a question of value, or cost of production, what precise article we assume as the medium of exchange. The supposition has, besides, the recommendation of being comfortable to the most ordinary state of the facts, for it is by the sale of his own finished article that each capitalist obtains the means of hiring laborers to renew the production which is virtually the same thing as if, 
instead of selling the article for money and giving the money to his laborers he gave the article itself to the laborers and they sold it for their daily bread assuming therefore that the laborer is paid in the very article that he produces it is evident that when any saving of expertise takes place in the production of that article if the laborer still receives the same cost of production as before he must receive an increased quantity in the very same ratio in which the productive power of capital has been increased but if so the outlay of the capitalist will bear exactly the same proportion to the return as it did before and profits will not rise the variation therefore in the rate of profits and those in the cost of production of wages go hand in hand and are inseparable mr ricardo's principle that profits cannot rise unless wages fall is strictly true if by low wages he meant not merely wages which are the produce of a smaller quantity of labor but wages which are produced at less cost reckoning labor and previous profits together but the interpretation which some economists have put upon mr ricardo's doctrine when they explain it to mean that profits depend upon the proportion which the laborers collectively receive of the aggregate produced will not hold at all for that in our first example remained the same and yet profits rose end of part one of essay four